our wonderful panelists uh, who will lead our conversation this morning. Uh, oh, great. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, yeah, my name is Jason Kreisberg. I'm going to be moderating this session. Um, as you probably know, we've got four speakers here, so we've got about 10 minute talks each. Um, after all the talks, we'll do a Q&A session. So um, as much as possible, try to hold on to your questions at the end. Um, if you do want to use the chat feature to send a question, you can send a question that way. I'll try to make a note of it. We can kind of circle back to it. But as much as possible, it'd be nice when we get to the Q&A, if people can raise their virtual hand, Tyler and I will call on you and you can go ahead and ask. Things are gonna go. Um, but with that, we will move things along. Our next speaker is uh, Chantelle Chang, uh, who will be telling us about the work she did in uh, Dr. Amir Zarnzapar's lab. Can everyone see my full screen? Yeah, looks nice. Awesome. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Chantal. I'm a rising third year undergraduate from UCSD from the Zahram Par Lab. And I was lucky enough to receive the Miriam Amadian Summer Fellowship this summer. And I'm doing a project on the role of gut microbial bile acid deconjugation on PCOS. So why are we studying PCOS? PCOS is the leading cause of infertility affecting upwards of 10% of women in the US and women who with PCOS that um, are able to get pregnant have a higher risk of pregnancy complications. Now, PCOS is implicated in what's called the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. So it's an interaction between these three things that I have diagrammed here. And this is connected working by hormone signaling. So the hypothalamus will secrete hormones to signal the pituitary, which signals the gonads to secrete reproductive hormones. So with PCOS women, you have elevated levels of reproductive hormones, such as androgens and estrogens. And that also leads to cysts in the ovaries because of that imbalance of the endocrine signaling. So these are the reproductive symptoms. Um, but I also want to draw attention to the metabolic symptoms. Um, in insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is when your cells are not responding to the hormone insulin. And so that means that your insulin typically signals your cells to take up glucose, but that's not happening because your cells don't respond to insulin and you have resistance to the hormone. And so weight loss is a really common intervention for women with PCOS. However, because majority of women with PCOS have insulin resistance that's completely independent of obesity, independent of their body weight, and so weight loss is completely ineffective. And there is a critical need for new therapeutics. So our lab is going to be studying PCOS in the letrozole model. So the letrozole mouse model um, is basically this drug tablet with letrozole in it that's implanted into the mouse and it replicates both reproductive and metabolic symptoms of PCOS. So one of the ways that we can track reproductive function in this model is the estrus cycle. And so this is basically the mouse equivalent of a female menstrual cycle, except it's shorter. And there's these four stages that I have listed here. Um, and so importantly, the LET model disrupts the estrus cycle so that um, that replicates the reproductive dysfunction that we see in PCOS. So why are we bringing in the gut microbiome? Well, there have been observed differences in gut microbiome composition between comparing PCOS women with healthy women. And so the gut microbiome is all of the gut microbes residing in, all of the microorganisms residing in our gastrointestinal tract. So they found compositional differences between the gut microbes of the healthy woman compared to the PCOS disease woman. So we already know gut microbiome affects metabolism, but we don't really know about its role in reproductive health. So there's already a study done that's linking the gut microbiome with PCOS by one of our collaborators. So over here, I listed the models that they used. So they had a placebo versus electrozole mouse model, which is just mean normal versus PCOS model. And then they had a letrozole with a superscript cohouse, which means that the PCOS model, sorry, the PCOS mouse was in the same cage as a placebo mouse. And so since mice eat each other's poop, if you put them in the same cage, the letrozole mouse will be exposed to the healthy mouse's gut microbiome. So in this first figure, you can see the four different stages of the estrous cycle over the days that it was tracked. 
And so here, the letrozole mouse or PCOS mouse is stuck in one stage of the cycle. But then if you look at the um, letrozole cohouse mouse, you have restored estrous cyclicity. So it looks just like, it looks very similar to the placebo healthy mouse. And so this also goes for our metabolic phenotype. So this is percent glucose in the blood over a time of two hours. And this gives us a gauge of the insulin signaling in the mouse. And so normally if your insulin is signaling your cells to take up glucose, it should decrease. But in our letrozole mouse, it's not decreasing as fast because it's insulin resistant. And if you look at our letrozole cohouse mouse, it's actually very similar to our healthy mouse curve. So how do we link the gut microbes um, effect to the PCOS phenotype? One of the findings in the study was that there were differences in bile acid composition between the two mouse models. So bile acids are signaling molecules. They have, they can bind to receptors on target organs and then initiate a bunch of physiological processes that are important to our health. So they're synthesized in the liver. Then when they're transported to the gut, there's these gut bacteria that that express what's called bile salt hydrolase or BSH, which can modify the bile acids or what's called bile acid deconjugation. So if they're structurally modifying the bile acids, that means that they're also altering the available pool of bile acids that act as signaling molecules. So we know these gut bacteria with BSH can modify the bile acid pool. And we also know that PCOS mice have an altered bile acid pool. So how do we study BSH and bacteria in this mouse model? That leads me to our lab's engineered native bacteria. So our engineered native bacteria, or ENB, um, expresses BSH to facilitate bile acid deconjugation. Then we can put it in a mouse of a disease phenotype. In this case, my case, it would be the electrozole PCOS model, and then study its phenotypic effects. Also important to note is that the bacteria will colonize the gut, um, which just means that it will stay in the mouse gut for the entire duration of the study after we give the mouse one gavage or give the bacteria to the mouse. So that leads me to my question, which is does bacterial bile acid deconjugation affect the dysfunction in a PCOS mouse? And we're hypothesizing that introducing our ENB to the PCOS mouse will protect against both metabolic and reproductive dysfunction in a PCOS mouse. So what do we already know about BSH in mice that's related to PCOS symptoms? Let's go back to insulin resistance. So if your cells are not responding to insulin, that also means that your body's going to secrete excess insulin because it's trying to make up for the glucose that's not being taken up by cells. So that means you'll have a high level of circulating insulin. So if we look here, this is our BSH plus, which means the mice with BSH expressing EMB. And then this is BSH minus, which means mice um, that do not have BSH expressing EMB. They have non-BSH expressing. And so if you look between our BSH plus and our BSH minus, um, our BSH plus has much lower circulating insulin after feeding. So these are insulin levels. And that gives us the conclusion that BSH is probably improving our insulin signaling and insulin response. Okay, next we can look at androgen levels. So recall that PCOS women have elevated androgens. And so this was data taken in normal male mice, and this is testosterone, which is just a specific type of androgen. And so we can see once again that our BSH plus has decreased androgen levels. And so we don't know necessarily that BSH plus mice will be, will have the same effect for female reproductive hormones. But from this data, we can kind of hypothesize that maybe it will decrease androgen levels in our PCOS mouse. So in our project, we have our mouse model and our bacteria. So that gives us our two different BSH minus, BSH plus, and then we have placebo and electrosome model, which I went over. So we have our negative control, which is non-BSH, non-phenotype. Then we have our two positive controls, one for the phenotype and one for the um, intervention. And then lastly, we have our positive, I'm sorry, our experimental, which is introducing BSH to our electrosome model. So I chunked our timeline into three different parts. So first we want to actually develop the disease phenotype that we're studying. And so to do this, we monitored our body weights. And what we want to see is that this is body weight over the age of the mice. We want to see that the letrozole mouse is trending to be significantly higher in body weight than our placebo mouse. So after we see this, we're able to give the ENB gavage into the mouse um, because we can presume that we have developed a PCOS phenotype 
And this is to help us confirm that we're giving the EMV as an interventional treatment. Okay, after we give the EMV, we want to actually check that it's colonized, staying in the mouse, and then we want to check that it's expressing BSH, because that's what we're studying. So we looked at colonization level. This is basically bacterial colony counts per gram of stool or poop that you collect from the mouse. And this is this is the first time that we gave the mice the bacteria. And then these are two colonization checks. This one was two days ago. And so since we're trying to say that it's the functional effect of BSH that is gonna hypo hypothetically help our mice, we don't want the amount of bacteria colonization to be a confounding factor. So that's exactly what we see, that between the four groups, the level of colonization is non-different or not significantly different between groups. Okay, lastly, we're currently at this step of the project, tracking meta uh, sorry, reproductive phenotyping through estrus cycle, and then we want to do metabolic phenotyping. And lastly, we want to take blood and tissue to look at things like hormone levels and whether there is development of cysts in the ovaries, looking at histology. So that would conclude my current study, but I also want to go over some future directions. So we can um, knock out the receptors that are specific to bile acids and then see its effects and mechanistically determine how bile acids are affecting reproductive health or PCOS or even the HPG. And then we can also introduce BSH prior to developing PCOS phenotype and see whether it's preventative to the disease. So in summary, we want to have more ideas on whether we can study the gut microbiome as a translational therapeutic for PCOS. And we also want to see whether we can determine and gain more insight on how bile acids are functionally affecting the parts of the HPG axis, its specific areas of effect, and where those receptors are. So that concludes my presentation. Give so many thanks to my mentors, Amir and Erica, um, and so thankful for this opportunity from the Saltillo Lab and the Ahmadian family, who I'm so honored to have been able to share this project with last week. And big thank you to my program coordinator, Shannon, um, for being so supportive and enthusiastic and everyone at my lab that has helped me and guided me this past year. Thank you for listening. Uh, that was great, Chantel. Thanks. Um, and thanks to everybody so far. We're doing a really nice job keeping on time. We've got... Mice is one week. Did, did I pick that up correctly? Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, 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 was only, I only know this because I, was, I saw her slide. No, so, yeah, I was going to say Michelle and I, Michelle and I are like doing the same thing right now. We're also doing vaginal smears. Um, yeah. I actually have a question for Michelle after. But yeah, basically it's usually like six to seven-ish days. Um, it kind of, it's really variable. Like, you know, our female menstrual cycle is also really variable. But um, yeah, it is definitely like the equivalent of the menstrual cycle. And it's really cool that... Um, like Michelle showed, that we can just like look under the mic microscope and see um, which stage they're in. But um, so my question for Michelle is, how many like how many days of estrocycling are you guys taking in order to like confirm that you have a phenotype? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, like I said, it's over like a longitudinal period. It's about four weeks. Um, but we're going in every day and taking a sample. And so um, after we you know, stained our slides and let them to dry, we're gonna analyze every single smear from every single day in those four weeks. So it's probably about, you know, 28 to 31 oh, days. Okay. Yeah, to confirm a phenotype. Um, and then based on yeah, the a long time. Yeah, I know it's a really long time. It's pretty um, uh, time consuming, but it's super cool to just see all of that data at the end and you can generate figures based on which one of the four stages of estrus are in. You can, we would hope to see some uh, normal reproductive phenotypes. So that would be like an equal amount of time mm -hmm. spent in all four stages of estrus. Cool. Yeah. Um, Question for Sean. Yeah, please, please, please. Sean, imagine this is your the it's last. Be one. Michelle or either Sean can either chime in as well. I mean, it, it, it seems like one of the big picture ideas that maybe at some point people could be treating PCOS with the microbiome based treatment. I mean, do do you think that is a possible? You know, maybe not. You know, in the next like two to three years, but but do you think that's sort of like a kind of a holy grail for one of these sort of things of like you know kind of coming up with these sort of treatments for for PCOS? 
Yeah, so there are no treatments to reverse PCOS. There are only therapeutic interventions like oral contraceptive pills and weight loss. And like I said, weight loss, for example, is completely ineffective. And nothing like reverses the actual disorder itself. So that's why we're trying to come up with a way that will um, be directly affecting um, like the HPG axis and like really try to like affect the endocrine signaling. And in that sense, um, figure out if we can use the gut microbiome as like probiotics, like our EMB, to treat PCOS. And Sean, you had mentioned, I think, a couple of times that, that PCOS does have an underlying genetic component. Um, is, is there a lot that's known about that? Or, or, you know, are there known genetic risk factors? If you've got a mutated version of this gene or that gene, you're this much more prevalent? 